Hi, I hope you're well and thank you for taking the time to connect with this. It's the third of our reflections in the series as we work through the Bible in a year. And those who are following the reading plan will be aware that in the Old Testament section we have been in the story of Abraham for the last week. And for much of the last week in the New Testament we have been following the Sermon on the Mount. There's a couple of things which link those passages. One is the idea of blessing and what it means to be blessed. The first few chapters of Genesis set up, if you like, the backstory for God's plans for the world. And although as early as Eden there are hints of God's plan to save the world, it's only really with Abraham that the story properly gets going. And it opens up with blessing. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Bless, blessed, blessing. Five times in a few lines. God is a God of blessing. God's longing for us and for our world is blessing. And as the story continues, the promise and the blessing develops. He arrives in Canaan and God tells him, to your descendants I will give this land. He's told to look around him, to the north and to the south, to the east and to the west. All this land I will give to your descendants forever. Again later, he's told to look at the sky and try to count the stars. Your offspring will be as numerous as that. And again, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The Sermon on the Mount also starts with blessing. Jesus climbs the hillside, sits down and begins to teach and opens with the words, blessed are. Jesus chooses an odd selection of people to be pronounced as blessed. And he doesn't say they will be blessed. It's blessed are. What pops into your head? when you hear the word blessed. I very much doubt it's the poor in spirit, the mourning, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. God's not in the habit of doing things the easy way. God doesn't start with the most promising material. Abraham has no land to speak of. He has no children and he's way past the point of expecting any. Hebrews says he's actually as good as dead. Not the most promising material to start blessing the whole world. And Jesus looks out on a crowd, on a hillside. And he looks around at those different groups of people and he will see those who are poor in spirit, those who are mourning, those who are meek, those who are persecuted. And he pronounces God's blessing on them. But nobody was thinking of those people as particularly blessed. What's going on? It's like God is emphasising that his love and blessing can reach us even when we're at the lowest. When, as the message describes the poor in spirit, you're at the end of your rope. Because it's not based on what we can achieve, but on what God longs to do for us. It's not something we can make happen in or what we bring to the party. It's all of God. It's all grace. It's all gift.
but on the flip side, we can get in the way. Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount by talking about wise and foolish builders. It's those who listen to what he says and do it who are wise. They're the ones whose house stands when the floods come. As they will do, they come to us all. Being blessed isn't about avoiding or staying clear of trouble. It's about being held in it. Being blessed is about God being with you. And we see that in the Abraham story. In the Bible, he's considered the faithful. The father, sorry, he's considered the father of the faithful. And rightly so in various ways. But one of those ways is that it doesn't come easy to him. He struggles to believe and to hold on to the faith for very long. A few times he's fearful that he's going to be killed because someone will want his wife. On other occasions, he tries to second-guess God or force God's hand. Every time he tries to take matters into his own hands, it starts to unravel. And without God, the whole thing would never have got going. But I picked up another link between the two sets of readings this week. It's that faith isn't always found where we expect it. I remember sitting in a community type meeting and where I felt that an idea that was being suggested was quite fanciful. And I commented to a local councillor, <laughs> you've got more faith than me. And someone else said, oh, if you've got less faith than him, we're all in trouble. But you know... Sometimes faith does come in the oddest of places. There are times when the Abraham story, you know, where the people he's dealing with are, seem to have more faith than Abraham. When they just seem to be better people. Jesus finishes the blessings and declares that those people that he's looking at are the light of the world and the salt of the air. But it's actually a Roman centurion who comes to him for healing, for a servant, and that leaves Jesus remarking, I've not found faith like that in all Israel. It's like he's saying, you're supposed to be the pagan godless one. And you believe more than all those who are supposed to. God doesn't choose the most obvious and easiest routes. He's not always at work amongst the most obvious of people. If God seems slow and responsive, is it because, well, we're slow to listen and respond? May we be a people attentive to God, to what he has to say to us. To be open to how God will fulfil his purposes and be willing to surprise, be surprised by those who have so much to teach us. Because that's how we end up blessed. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the story of Abraham. It's a story which reminds us of your longing to bless us and to bless the whole world. It's also a story of your commitment to that, how we can get in the way, and yet you still find a way to move the story forward. Help us to trust that whatever we are experiencing, you are with us, you're on our side. We are held, and in that holding is the greatest blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen.